Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today, by the grace of God, we will conclude uh, what we started last week. I am really excited um, within this period. And uh, the reason I am excited is because I know that the Lord is answering a lot of prayers and providing a lot of directions, you know, to a lot of us in view of what we are studying. Um, I am so sure that God has something for you today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And how do I know that? Because the Bible says it's the will of the Father to give us the kingdom. There is nothing. God doesn't, you know, the things that we're asking God for and all the rest of them, he really doesn't need it. It is his good will to give it to us. Praise the Lord. And that is why I am so sure that if we reach out to him tonight in faith, according to what he has stipulated, that he will surely get back to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we started a very important study. And what we were studying was the key of kingdom, uh, receiving kingdom breakthroughs. The key of what? Persistence. And we, we, we began to see in that particular area that, look, God is interested in our doing what? Not giving up. Quitters never win. Winners will not quit. So what does that mean? That irrespective of what you're doing, irrespective of, you know, what you're asking of him, don't give up yet. Don't. Your miracle is on the way. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what I'm actually trying to bring forward in that direction is not, is not just about persistence. And saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to pray today, tomorrow, the next day, with irrespective of anything. However, we need to understand what are we persisting in? What is the process, you know, that we are persisting, that we are using to drive our persistence? The reason is because in as much as you're well-intended, in as much as your needs are genuine, in as much as what you're asking him, you know, you're even praying in the name of Jesus. But if the processes don't align together, it becomes a problem. And this could explain why a lot of us, you know, we stand in the presence of our breakthrough and we never really get it. Not because God's hand is too short, not because he is incapable of giving it to us, but the reason is because we have not done the right things that God has stipulated for us to do. And, you know, the good thing too about it is that these things, the process of God, you know, is not hidden. It's not hidden. It's all there in scriptures. And, you know, except we search, except we test more of the spirit, except we ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand, we may actually just be glossing over it. You know, you might just be saying in the morning, I have my quiet time. In the evening, I also pray. But the question is, what is the content of your prayer? How do you pray? How do you pray? A time came in and Jesus was telling his disciples, he said, look, when you pray, and that's where we are studying since last week, the book of Matthew chapter 6 from verses 9 to 13. Today we might just extend a little bit to verse 15 because of the concepts we're going to look into. And the point we're trying to make is this. Yes, I need to be persistent, but how do I persist? So we studied two principles last week that will help us, or two laws, that will help us to really persist the way that God wanted, wants us to persist. And the first one was what? The, the law, law of identity. identity. The law of identity. Where is your father? Who is your father? Whose child are you? And we recollect, you will recollect from last week's talk, you know, that we actually, our father actually lives where? In heaven. In heaven. And again, we will see that the fact that your daddy lives in heaven, that our father lives in heaven, it matters a lot. You know, today we serve, we, we, we see, we, we are living in a generation where people have their gods in their pockets. They have their gods under their pillow. They have their own father under their bed. They have their own father in the village. And we said that the jurisdiction that your father has, you know, has, you know, legal authority over matters a lot. If your father is the God of heaven and earth, it means that he sees all, he knows all, and he can do all things. Praise the Lord. So what was the second law that we studied last week? The law of worship. The law of worship. God bless you, brother. Now, the law of worship stipulates, you know, can we just pack it just a little bit and let it be all about God? When last did you give God a heartfelt worship? 
When last did you, irrespective of the situation and circumstances that is trying to drown you, you have actually risen above yourself and you have said, good, look, God, this is all about you. It's not about my enemies. It's not about me. It's not about my problem. It's all about you. And God is expecting us to give, you know, on equal worship, you know, an acknowledgement to him as our father today without you know spending much time because we have a couple of them and i don't want to spill this over to next week because by the grace of god next week is going to be the bottom part of the month of july and we're trusting god for something big next week and i'll tell you a little bit about that later on but for today i want us to conclude this aspect and then get on with you know uh receiving our miracles from god so the law of alignment is the third one the law of alignment. And if we find that in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 10. Remember, our text from last week has been Matthew, chapter 6, from verses 9 to 13. So today, we will be looking at verse 10. And please, if you're there in verse 10 of the book of Matthew, chapter 6, please, could you just read it out to us loud? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm going to move a little bit fast. Permit me. Because each of these laws can take us one week to explore. But we don't have one week. So we have seven of them. These seven laws you know, of persistence crammed into just two weeks. So permit me today if I have to run a little bit fast. Okay? So alignment talks about, you know, having to apportion yourself, having to conform to an already made agreement or something that is already tailored, a way, a path that has already been created. You are expected to do what? To conform to it, to agree with it, to pattern yourself up according to that particular method or methodology that has, has actually been created. And when we talk about alignment, we are saying that, look, it means that there is something already that has been created to which we are expected to conform. Now, when you say thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, okay, as it is in heaven. Let's even talk about thy kingdom come. Now, whose kingdom are we talking about here? Because if you say, look, let thy kingdom come and let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it means that there is already, you know, a pattern that has been set down. Now, whose kingdom are we talking about? Do you realize that you actually belong to a kingdom? Do you realize that the kingdom to which you belong to is not just the kingdom of this world? You also belong to where? The kingdom of heaven. The Bible says that he has translated us from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of what? His marvelous light. So we operate from there. That's where we operate from. The kingdom of his marvelous light. Now what that means is that you're looking at this kingdom and you're looking at alignment it means that this particular, remember, what is the kingdom? A kingdom is a jurisdiction in which a king rules. And when you have kings, you have laws. It reminds you of laws because you can't just enter into somebody's kingdom and do whatever you want. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of us Christians do, consciously or unconsciously. You know, we try to come into God's kingdom at our own terms. We come in and we don't want to align. It says, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. Not mine. I know that I have my will. I know that I have something that, oh, this is good to do. This is good to have. This is good to, you know, to say. But I shouldn't just because I have it. I shouldn't just because I think it is right. I need to deliberately do what? Align myself to a kingdom. Now, what this actually means, look at it, an ambassador. There is no ambassador that serves at his own pleasure. An ambassador to another country will always serve as the, at the pleasure of the president. And any day that the ambassador refuses or ceases to conform to the, the will of the president, to the specifications of the country, what do they do? They will recall him back. So unfortunately, a lot of us say, hey, this is the kingdom of God. I know we are there, but you know, I'm also here. And I actually want to come to God at my own terms. It will never work that way. So when we say thy will be done on earth, please, you know, 
Jesus made it very clear in the book of Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. A time came, you know, the disciples came and said, ah, you know, you know what, your mom, your dad, your brothers and sisters, and they are looking for you. And Jesus said, no, 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 don't bother about it. Whoever does the will of my father is who? Is my brother, is my sister. That's the people, that's my family members. That's the people. Remember when we said, it, when we talked about the concept of identity, we said, look, God is our father. Our father, he has other children. And Jesus is trying to define this in that concept of our. And he says, my brothers, my sisters are the people who do the will of God. Now, it just means that if you do not comply to the will of God, it's a problem. It means that the fatherhood of God does not actually cover you. Why? Because you're not playing according to pattern. The rule of alignment or the law of alignment. Now, I want to take us a little bit further here. Now, where does this will need to be done? Because, you know, sometimes when we talk about the will of God, and I hope that one of these days by God's grace, we'll be able to break it down, to look at that. You know, I, I would want to look at the book of John chapter 10, and, you know, and keep us there for a while and actually show us what it means to be led by God or what it means to understand the will of God or even to hear the voice of God because it's extremely important. You know, each time we say, oh, the will of God, the will of God, and some of us will say, oh, but what is this will of God? It will be a discussion for another day. But for today, suffice it to say, where exactly does this will need to be done? Now, if you look again in verse 10, it says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It means that there is a place where the will of God is already not under contention. Where is that place? In heaven. And now look at what we do as Christians. Now let me explain this very well so you can understand it. Now when you're praying, what you're actually doing is that you're bringing stuff down from the spiritual realm and you're bringing it, you're forcing it to the kingdom of men. That's exactly what you're doing. Because it says his will is already is done in heaven. Everything you need is already there. It's already established. God has it. You're looking for a good husband. God has it in store. You're looking for miracles. God has it in store. You're looking for a good job. God has it in store. You're looking for new body parts. God has it. And now you need to bring it down. And now you're saying, God, let your will be done as it is in heaven here on earth. So there are two areas where that represents earth, you know, as the Bible actually says it. The first one is you, your life as an individual. Now, if you read the book, if you get to the book of Second Corinthians, you know, where the Bible talks about, but we have these treasures in earthen vessels. We are earthen vessels. Remember again, we are the vessels of, you know, we are vessels of earth. And if any man shall purge himself and all the rest of them, we are, you are the number one place we have the will of God needs to be established. You are the number one place where the will of God needs to be established. You are the number one place. Now, but the question is, why is it that God is requiring his will to be done? Can't he just leave us alone? Let him, since the will is, is already been done in heaven, that suffices. And, you know, we can just do our own thing here and then let him answer our prayers and let's just do our own thing. But why is it required? Can somebody read for us the book of John chapter 5 verse 30? Read the book of John chapter 5, verse 30. I would love the Amplified Version if you have it, or the New International Version. Very New fast. International, yes, New Margo International ahead, Version. Yes. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Praise the Lord. Now, now you, see, you see why we can't just trust ourselves, okay? You see why we can't just trust ourselves and say, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I, you know, you, sometimes you actually wonder, why is it that God wants so much of us to want so much of him? Jesus tells us here in the book of what? Matthew, John chapter 5, verse 30. He says, of my own, I will not be able to do anything. Not. And it doesn't mean whether it is a big thing or a small thing. You know, some people only get to God when it is a big problem. You know, some people will just only get to God when it is something, oh, I need this now, my enemies, my this, I need this. No, no, no. And then you actually don't think that cooking in the morning in the kitchen, you know, making that cup of coffee, that you should actually pray about it. Wait until they tell you what happens to some people as kitchen accidents just because they wanted to make a cup of coffee. Now, what are we talking about here? You know, we think it's all oh, so small. 
So Jesus said, look, guys, you just can't trust yourself. It's not about you. Why? The reason is because you can do nothing. You are not able to do anything. You can do nothing of your own self. Now, and then he comes back again. In that particular scripture, we can see another thing. And he says, look, the reason is because we are prone to error. Remember, the Bible says in the book of James that you ask and you do not receive. Why? Because you because ask to amiss. you ask amiss so that you can actually spend it in your own lust. So we are prone to error. And Jesus said, hey, don't trust your will so fast. Don't trust your will. Another thing we can see in that verse 30 is the fact that we seek our own things. Jesus said, I do not seek my own. However, not my will. Because what? I am not seeking my own things. I am seeking the things of God. Let me ask you, what percentage of your prayer point is conformed to God? What percentage of your prayer point is seeking God actually or seeking the things of God? What is the percentage? Let's analyze your prayer this morning. Okay, let's just take a little time and analyze your prayer this morning. You prayed? Yes, I believe you prayed this morning. Probably for 30 minutes, yes. You know, or for an hour, praise God. But let's analyze what you really prayed about. How much of that prayer conformed to the will of God? You know, because sometimes we spend 90% of our time and we actually just pray, give me, give me, give. Listen, let, let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. God knows that you need these things. He knows. In fact, he is so sure that you need them, that he has made a provision for you to ask for them. So he says, instead of just pursuing these things, they will come to you. But first of all, seek ye the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And Jesus began to say in this book of John 5, 30, and he says, look, I, I, don't trust yourself. It's not about you. Why? Because your will, in your purest intention, what do you do? You still ask amiss. You seek your own things instead of the things of God. And then the last thing that he said in that particular scripture that I want to bring out is that we actually seek our own judgment. We make our own judgment. Brethren, a lot of times we are mistaken in our judgments. So many times. So many times. Oh, it is this person that is causing my problem. If, if not for this, my uncle, if not for this, my aunt, you might just be wrong. You might just be wrong. In fact, if only that that teacher didn't actually do this, I would have had an A. In fact, I hate him. In fact, I, no, you might also be wrong. And Jesus said the best way to conform, to align yourself is not to trust your judgment. Now, whose judgment will you trust? If your judgment is influenced when you say, thy kingdom come, then you will judge right. You know, because the Bible says in another place that Jesus said, look, I judge not as I see. I judge not as what is happening. You know, because sometimes things are not the way you see them. So if you need to exercise godly judgment, you need to pray thy will be done. His will will need to be done in your life. Because certain things that we perceive, we do not actually have a good understanding or interpretation of them. Another reason there is because Jesus wants us to see the big picture. Not my will, but your will be done. The big picture. What is the big picture? My sister, my brother, have you ever actually sat down to analyze in your life, why are you here? Why are you on this side of eternity? Are you just here to go to heaven? Probably you should have died by now so that you can actually go and meet Jesus. But you are supposed to be here to influence and impact certain things. And if you are here to do that, the best way, the surest way that is acceptable unto God is by compliance, by aligning, with your, aligning yourself to the purposes and to the will of God. Now, the second dimension there, the second dimension is the dimension of our world, our sphere. The systems of this world. Remember, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. Where is earth? One, in my life. Number two, in the systems that we are part of. Let me ask you a question. Is God glorified in the system that you represent? A lot of us as Christians, we think that, oh, I am, I am a Christian, you know, uh, accountant. I am a Christian geographist. I am a, a geographer. I'm a system I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian doctor. I'm a Christian. No, you are one person. 
And as long as you're impressed, it's either that the, the, the lordship of Jesus is recognized both in your life and in your career, you cannot separate who you are from what you do. Absolutely not correct. The reason that a lot of us as Christians, we have dual lives is because we think, no, no, no. When I get to the office, I have to behave in a certain way. When I am running my business, I have to run it in a certain way. And so some Christians today take bribes. Some Christians, we give it all kinds of names. And we make it sound good. We call it white lies, gray lies, yellow right, lies. And whatever you might actually, you know, we put good names on it. You know, some people I heard say that bribes are what, you know, uh, what do you call it? Thank you in advance. You are actually just thanking. Some other people say it's just a point of negotiation. Whatever we call it, the point is that Jesus is interested in his will, the will of the Father being done in your life as a Christian, individually, as well as in the, Christ, in, in the systems that you represent. My sister, do people in your workplace know you as somebody who tells the truth? If there is a go-to person where they will say, look, look, I'm, I'm sure that she will tell me the right thing. Do they actually, do they actually know you for that? Or are you blending everywhere? The systems have overtaken us. A lot of us today, the systems of this world have so much overtaken our lives that we really have nothing to show for in our Christian lives. But that's not the original way that God has created it. It is supposed to be you being influenced by the will of God and the systems that you represent also being influenced by the will of God, such that the kingdom of God comes in your life and also comes around you. Brethren, except we live our lives, we come to that position where we can live our lives and say, of the truth, what I do in secret is what I can be called out, you know, in, 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 in the light or, you know, in, a, in the presence of everybody. We may not actually be living the way that Jesus has stipulated for us to live. Are you living a life of hypocrisy? Is there a double standard? In the office, we know you are somebody else. At, at play, we know you are somebody else. But actually, when you come to church on Sunday, you are really sanctimonious. You're really very holy. We look at you, you can't even say something. Ah, hello, good afternoon. Ah, hi, good morning. And, and then eventually you go out there, you, are, you behave more than a wolf. It ought not to be. Thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Praise the Lord. And I just know that I don't have a lot of time, but I want to I wanna pause here just a little bit. You know, for one or two minutes, and I want to actually pick your, your, your minds on this one. What are the biggest constraints to you personally as a Christian? Why alignment to God's will is a problem? I want us to look at that right now. You know, let's just pause. Let, let's, let's internalize this. Because if we don't align, it's difficult. Let me tell you, God is looking for a man. He is still looking for men women, that he will pour out his power into their lives. Now, the only problem, can he trust you? If he gives you that realm of power you're asking for, if he gives you that miracle you're asking for, are you just going to walk out of the street and continue doing another thing? And in that way, people will now say, ah, look at this person, even though they are doing miracles, you know, and yet their lives is not a Have you noticed that there are lots of people probably that seemingly have power, but they lack character? The question is, can God really trust in you? Can God actually count on you? So can, can we talk about it a little bit, just a couple of minutes? What are the biggest constraints in your life as a person, you know, that you feel that actually, you know, doesn't allow you to con con conform, you know, or to align yourself to the will of God? Yes, please unmute yourself if you, you want to say something. Otherwise, I'm just going to call and pick on people to say something. Please uh, tell us. Yes, please go ahead. I would say for me, because I hadn't aligned for a long time, even though I was a professing Christian, I, because I, I didn't have that deep knowledge of God and his plan and purpose and the fact that within me, God has deposited his power and the potentials to bring forth his kingdom. So not having that full awareness, not having the knowledge of what God could do with one single me, a little Jasmine, was depriving me of really aligning with his purpose. So I would right. say that, was, that would be my biggest one. Praise the Lord. Ignorance, you know, an inability to actually figure it out, to really understand that depth and breadth that God wants you to really understand. Yes, please, another person. Another person. What is the biggest, what is the single? Now, I, I know this is a little bit personal, but I want us to really get it. You know, because when you try to answer this question, then you can look, you know, put the searchlight on yourself and actually ask yourself, what is it exactly that I'm doing and how am I doing it? 
Okay, let's take one more person before we move forward. What is the problem? Why, why is alignment an issue? Why is alignment a problem? Yes, tell me, please. I'm going to call names. Sister Joyce, can you tell me? Um, I think that um, one of the issues could be when... Oh, we can't hear you. Could you talk a little bit louder? Oh, sorry. Um, I think that one of the issues could be when you look at someone else who's doing something similar to what you're doing and you're thinking that the things that would align you to God's pathway for you, it seems like it's the slower route or it's the less popular route and you're kind of in, you're being peer pressured sometimes into doing what everyone else in that area is doing as well. Amazing, that's, that's so profound, thank you. You know, you, you look at your neighbor and grass is always green, you know, over at your neighbor's house, right? Because you really don't know what's, whether, whether green is green or green is something else. And so she says that when you look at some other person succeeding and, you know, their lives are really not like aligned and you're asking yourself, why, why should I really be going this way? You know, I've come to a point in this race when I, had tell, when I tell myself every day, I tell myself, look, you know, even if Jesus comes now and I live my life, I, I have lost nothing. I have lost not. What do you lose in telling a lie? What do you lose in, you know, really living a riotous life and all the rest of them? You know, because it is when you begin to look at those things as, oh, they, they enjoy more and I am not enjoying and I'm going to church and they are saying, do this, do, you know, if you look at those things as restrictions, you find out that it becomes cumbersome. Praise the Lord. So thank you very much for that stuff. Let's move ahead a little bit. Now we'll take two laws together. And, but we'll break them down. And then that's the next verse, verse 11, chapter 6, verse 11. The law of dependency and the law of consistency. Both of them are in that particular verse 16, uh, verse uh, 11, Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Remember, we are saying we need to persist. Yes, but how do we persist in the place of prayer, in the place of seeking the Lord? And the next one is the law of what? Dependency. Give us this day our daily bread. That's that verse. That verse, we would break it down using two laws. So the first one is give us. Give us talks about what? The law of dependency. When last did you really humble yourself to ask God for something? No, I, I'm really saying ask because I, 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 you know, I'm qualifying it. It says give us. You know, because the, the language we speak when we actually pray most of the time is, God, I command you in the name of Jesus. I command heaven. Now, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't command anything. I mean, when you're dealing with the devil, you just want to command him, right? But if, you're, if, you come, if you came into your father's presence on a good day in the morning, and you say, Daddy, good morning. Daddy, how are you doing? In fact, Daddy, I command you right now to give me my breakfast. Seriously. <laughs> if it's me, my children will tell more what I will do. Uh, praise the Lord. Yeah, really? Command me to give you your breakfast. Come and eat. <laughs> Praise God. So a lot of us, we use the wrong languages when we actually come to God. The lot of dependency. How do you relate with God in that? Some of us even threaten God. We say, look, God, I'm giving you 24 hours. If you don't do this, that I'm going to turn around. You know, story has it that there was somebody that went to the campground, you know. You know, the campground is that place where you can actually, you know, uh, have a retreat or something like that. So this guy, and he has a ministry went to the campground and another brother, a good, well-intended brother was also praying, you know, doing a prayer walk and coming around the corner. And then he had this brother shouting and he was shouting, God, look, in the name of Jesus, I give you up to December. If there are no miracles and signs and wonders in this ministry, I will leave this Bible and leave you alone. Seriously, you're telling God that, you know, I, do you threaten God? Do you come and say, God, I am going, in fact, I'm going to go away. If I fail this course now, I am actually going to backslide. In whose interest is that, you know? And then some of us also, we come to the presence of God. And instead of saying, God, please give me, what are we doing? We are comparing ourselves with ourselves, just like what our sister Joyce said. And in that particular instance, we are now telling God, look, God, sister, Justin has a beautiful hair. Oh God, what about me? Look at me, I'm even bald. Or look at me, I can't even go to the... Seriously? The Bible says that you're beautifully and wonderfully, fearfully and wonderfully made. And godliness with contentment is great gain. 
My sister, when you say, give us this day, our daily bread, do you really know? Now, it also tells us, give us, tells us that God is bigger than we are because you can only ask somebody who is bigger or who has something more than you do to be able to do what? To give me, give me water, give me food, give me this. Some of us still don't believe that God is big enough to give to us. And so what do we do? We make our own alternative arrangement. We make our own alternative. Look, if God does not give me a husband this year, that is it. I'm actually going to go out there. Whoever I see right now, I am just going to get married to the person. Seriously. You will need to really understand the fact that what happens, that God is big enough. And remember, the quality of a person that makes a promise to you will determine whether you actually go with the person or not. So the concept, we should know that God is sufficient He's, he has infinite capabilities, you know, to be able to meet our need. The Bible says in the book of Psalms chapter 24, verse 1, Psalms 21, 24, verse 1. What does it say? That the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, do you see why it is important that God should be in heaven? Why? Because the earth is his own. <laughs> and the fullness thereof, it's not just the earth, the fullness thereof, the people and they that live therein. So any of your miracles that somebody is holding who lives on earth, God can actually speak to him and say, hey, 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 this is my land, I, I'm, I'm the Lord here. Do what? Go to my daughter's house and give her this. Go to my son's house and give him this. Why? Because the earth is the Lord. And this is the one you're saying, give me. So when we ask God to give us, we recognize the fact that the giver has the ability to give. Now look at the sentence structure of that particular verse. Look at the sentence structure. It says, give us. And then it says, you know, all the things that are in between. And it says, bread, our daily bread. Bread. Now what does bread mean? Bread could be tangible and intangible things. God is not limited. You know, we don't only come to God when it is a breakthrough service. And we want to actually, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, it's only breakthrough service and we only want to uh, get big, big miracles from God. No, no, no. The little, little things to God is interesting. And I just saw a question from someone who is saying, you know, the fact that we command God, does that mean you no, know, we are arrogant or something like that? I would rather command the devil than God. Why? <laughs> I want to be in God's good books. Now, to some extent, it might not actually, you know, state arrogance. Why am I saying this? Because we are used to that prayer language. In the name of Jesus, I command you rain. Stay there. Yeah, that's an elemental thing. In the name of Jesus, I command snow. No snow today. That's something. But do you really command God? Do you really, you know, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, concerning the works of my hands, do you command me? Commanding me? Are you really commanding me? You know, look at what happened when Job, you know, began to talk about, even though Job was clean, he didn't do anything bad and all the rest of them, but that calamity came upon him. And then he was beginning to question God. God came down in his bigness. And what did God say to him? He said, Job, where were you when I was creating the earth? Job, if you say you know much, where is the foundation? Where did I hide the foundation of this earth? Where is it? So I, I think that the language, when we talk to our father, yes, when you're dealing with principalities and powers, command them, you know, command them, let them get out of there. Command sickness and, you know, sicknesses and diseases, let them get away from your, your path. Command the demons, let them get away from your path. But when you deal with God, you need to re realize that you're dealing with your father. You need to realize that you're dealing with an entity that is much bigger than you are. You need to realize that you're dealing with somebody that, does really, that doesn't really need you to exist, but you need him to exist. Praise the Lord. I hope that answers a little bit of that question. All right, so substance here will signify, you know, tangible and intangible things. Uh, the Bible says in the book of John chapter 14, and just because of our time, we might not read all of these verses. Um, 14 from verses 13 to 14. Ask anything in my name, anything. He that told, have you not asked anything in my name? Now, is it possible, my brother, my sister, that you have been asking wrong? It is it possible that you have been asking amiss? Remember, alignment. Is it possible that you have been asking amiss? Is it possible that you have not been asking well? There are three levels of ask. That would be another discussion for another day. There are wonderful keys loaded in those three aspects. Ask, seek, and knock. I, 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 I don't want to be drawn into it this evening because it's a whole week of another, you know, discussion, another teaching. 
but but there are those three levels and remember we're talking about persistence persistence in asking persistence in knocking now brethren let me ask you when you stand on the door of your breakthrough do you know which of those keys to apply do you know which of the keys to apply should you be knocking should you be seeking right what exactly which of the keys or should you be uh, uh, actually asking you don't want to go to a place that you should be knocking and then you're just asking <laughs> you also don't want to go to a place that you should really be seeking and you're only knocking it makes a whole lot of difference praise the lord Hallelujah. So then we look at the same verse 11 and there is the lot of consistency this lot of consistency it says this day our daily and then bread okay give us this day brethren god expects us to show up every day somebody will say oh i read my bible yesterday i, I prayed yesterday really have you heard that his great his love is new every morning do you know let me let me shock you just a little bit do you know that the day and the night that there is a gate there is a door between the day and the night how many hours do we have in the day how many hours do we operate by Oh. Come on, somebody. How many hours? How many hours do we have in the day? Twelve. No, okay, in the day, in a, in the whole day, as in twenty four hours. Twenty four hours. Now, what happens? Every tw at the end of every twenty four hours, there is you know this is the secret where people pray midnight prayers. I'm not saying okay, go and start praying. No, but this is the secret why people pray midnight prayer because at the end of the midnight, what happens? It is the it's beginning of another day. It is the beginning of another cycle, and God is saying, "Every my love is new every morning. The grace of today will not lead you tomorrow." The grace of yesterday is expired. Why do you have to go with the grace of yesterday when you can have the grace of today? So a lot of us, we are still living in 1999. A lot of us might still be living in year 2000. A lot of us might still be living in year 2010. Why? Because the grace of today is not abundant in our lives. But Jesus says, look, when you ask the Lord, ask the Father, say, give me this day the grace for today. Brethren, if I look at your life right now, will I be seeing the grace of 2020? Some of you now, some of us today, we are actually counting on the testimonies of five years ago. How about today? How is Jesus on the inside today? Give me this day, my daily bread. It means that God wants you to show up every day. The Lord of consistency. The Lord of consistency says that you don't give up. Remember, persistence and consistency. Persistence means that irrespective of the difficulty, Consistency means that you show up every day. You do the same thing. You come in there, you still ask the Lord. You still ask the Lord. You still ask the Lord. Now, there are some dangerous proverbs that, you know, coming from where I'm coming from originally. Let me share some of them with you because you might actually not be coming from my place originally. So let me just share a couple of these proverbs so you'll understand. Some of these dangerous proverbs, somebody says, if you go to the Iroko tree, if you, if you climb on top of the Iroko tree, so the Iroko tree is like a very gigantic big tree. It says if you climb up there, better collect all the things that you require so you will not go a second time. And I want to tell you that that is falsehood because yes, you can go a second time. And this is the reason why people, when they get into, you know, they translate it to several things. When you get into a position of office, you think, look, there is no tomorrow. Let me just get it now, 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 now. So a lot of us will think, look, I'm only going to approach God today. No, if you leave tomorrow, God has assured your bread for tomorrow. Listen, you know, God has, listen, God is unlimited in his provision. Let's not have the poverty mentality. Let's collect it now. As I am going to church, I'm collecting the whole anointing for the week. Who told you that? No, there is an anointing for every day. There is a grace for every day. God is awesome and sufficient, benevolent every day. His mercies are past finding out. My brother, my sister, you look at the difference here. When you live in the anointing of just, it's like eating uh, 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 leftover food. You know, sometimes it doesn't taste like the original, the one you just prepared. Have you noticed that when guests come to your house or when people, even your children sometimes when you cook food, they want the one that mommy just made today. Oh, mommy, why are we not eating this one? Why, why the one of yesterday? Why? Because everybody wants something fresh. Everybody wants newness. And God is guaranteed 
by the Lord of consistency to do what? To bless you and to give you enough providence for the day. Praise the Lord. Now, the second Hallelujah. proverb, second proverb that I actually want to talk about in that direction, he says that if your brother is in heaven, you don't have to go to hellfire. Hey, listen to me. <laughs> People can go to hellfire when their brothers are in heaven. <laughs> True. The reason is because you think, oh, my brother is going to church to go and pray for us. Have you heard people when they say, oh, you're going to church, please pray for us. No, come and pray for yourself. Come and ask the Lord. There is a reason why God is saying, give me this day, give us this day, our what? Daily bread. God expects you also to come in. Praise the Lord. So the Hallelujah. second level dependency doesn't work with God. The second level dependency does not work with God. And this is something we need to be very, very careful about. Now, because of our time, I would have to go very fast on the last two laws. The next law, the law six, is the law of retribution. And if we look at it in the book of Matthew chapter 16, please let somebody read very fast for us. Uh, Matthew chapter six, verse, read verse 12 for me. Read verse 14 and also verse 15. I will just take them together. Remember, we are talking about the seven laws of persistency. What exactly, how do you persist? And the how is what we are dealing with. And out of the how, we are dealing with seven laws. So we've talked about five laws right now. We're on the sixth one, the law of retribution. Please somebody read for me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, verse 14, and verse 15. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Is that okay? Right. Nice. Yeah. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. Verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Mm. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Extremely important. So explicit. It's very, very clear in black and white. So, so this is one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people, it's not because you're not persisting, it's not because you're not consistent, it's not because you're not dependent on God, it's not because you don't identify him as your father, but just because you don't, you can't let go. Someone offends you and you want to, you know, some people say that revenge is best served what? Cold. And you hold it in your heart for one week. You hold it in your heart for one month. I will never, in fact, God will be the one to judge me and you. That was the judge or whatever, the judgment of this, this case between us is going to be in hell. Seriously, you think you'll get there? You know, because the Bible says, forgive and it will be forgiven. So Jesus was telling them, look guys, when you pray and you really want God to hear you, listen, if you don't forgive, nothing, you're not going anywhere. If you don't forgive, you're not going anywhere. Remember that, you know, one of the reasons why people don't trust God enough to fight their battles or to actually revenge on their behalf. You know, the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 19, that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. One of the reasons why people don't trust is because they don't really understand that God is in heaven. <laughs> God is not in your village. As in, he's not limited to your village. He's not under your bed, such that he, you know, he is not able to see things that are outside your bed. You know, he's not in your pocket, such that you carry him. With no, he's in heaven. He sees all. He knows all. He judges all. We can trust him. You know, one of the biggest lessons I've learned in life is to give people forgiveness in advance. Everybody that comes across my path has a five-year automatic rechargeable forgiveness. Whatever you do to me, I have a garbage bag, I put it in there. Why? Because I'm already expecting that offenses will come. So when it comes, I am not surprised. I just dump it where it belongs. Five years. So before you think, okay, I'll get to another five years and I will offend her, I will renew it, automatic recharge. Now, what does that tell me? What does that do for me? It means for me that I, I don't want to get encumbered at all. Now, you are not me, I understand. And I don't want to trivialize, you know, some pains that might have been in people's lives where you say, ah, this person, I will never forgive you. I will never forget what. But here, God is saying, look, do what? Hey, my child, forgive, forget. It's okay. It's okay. Listen, you, you think God will not be able to punish this person the way I'll punish it. Seriously. And I've seen people who are looking to punish others and they die. Why don't you just wait and let God fight the battle for you? There are so many things that we have missed out on. Why? Because we can't just forgive our mates. And God is saying here, look, if you don't forgive another person, hey, I'm not bound to forgive you. 
So it's, it, it, it's, it's not, it, there are no two ways about it. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. No, 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 no sorry. Did you forgive your, 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 in fact, it's as bad as if you remember that I have something against you. Not that you have something against me. That you should make peace with me before bringing your offering. Offering. That's exactly what scriptures expect us to do. It, it, it's a higher road. It's a higher path to follow. And I know it's tough. I know it's difficult. You know, and, and there's a class exercise here that would have done, would have talked about what are those things that actually help or make us not to forgive easily. But just because of our time, probably if we have a couple of minutes at the end, I will come back to that. And then the final one, the number seven, the law seven, is the law of acknowledgement. And this is Matthew 6, 13. It says, first of all, and lead us not into temptation. Brethren, time will fail me to walk this scripture very, very well. Forgive me that I'm not going to work it as I wanted to. Because there are two sections in that verse. First of all, lead us not into temptation. Is the Lord your leader? Who is, who is leading you? A lot of us are leading ourselves. A lot of us, we are the leaders. And listen, in the kingdom of God, the advancement that God, the principle of advancement in this kingdom is that we are followers. Leaders are rebels. Go and read your Bible in the book of John chapter 10. And I'm not talking about it literally that we don't have a leader. We don't have, no, no, no. I'm talking about people who in their heart are the ones leading themselves. It's dangerous. Because they, they look at again, John chapter 5 verse 30. You can easily lead yourself in the law wrong way. Why? Because you can't trust yourself. We're so prone to mistakes. We're so prone to evil as humans. So everything that comes from an unchanged mind cannot give glory to God. So we subject ourselves to the Lord of acknowledgement. God, you're my leader. Please lead me away from temptation. Brethren, there are temptations in this world. And it says, deliver us from all evil. Why? Because your own is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And if you tell God that, you think about it. You come into the throne room of God and you say, hey, daddy, this morning, you know, I really need you to lead me. I, I don't want to get into the snares of the fowler. I don't want to, you know, dash my foot against the stone. I don't want to be, you know, uh, encumbered by the enemy. I don't want to be exacted on by the forces of darkness. Lord, why am I saying this? Because yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. You're telling God that, Lord God, I believe you because you're able to do this. And this is why somebody like Job could say, look, God, even, though, even if he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Yet will I follow him. So that you know that when you have prayed, you come out and circumstances, wind is blowing everywhere. And circumstances are adverse. And you know, no, 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 Lord, I know. Because thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. These things are what? They are just temporary things. They will not impact my faith. That's why the Apostle Paul was beginning to say, what is it that can separate us from the will of God? Is it tribulation? Is it trials? Is it hunger? What is it? Why? Because you understand, you acknowledge God and you say, God, I know that yours is the kingdom. You cannot give it to any man except you will it. You cannot actually make anybody prosperous except you are interested in it. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Do you know that all power belongs to God or we just sing it? Have you experienced the fact that all powers belong to God? Is this something that is close to your heart? Do you really need it? Now, let me say something. And I, I, this will also take us another week of, you know, talking about it. Evil exists. What is it that the Lord is actually, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, saving us from? If you read the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, and time will fill me to, to walk that scripture very well. It talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. It talks about principalities. It talks about powers. It talks about rulers of darkness of this world. Brethren, those things are existent. They are there. Do you know what principalities are? They are demons, spiritual powers that have legal authority over your life. And, and time will fill me to talk about it. Because certain things, the keys you use to fight principalities are not the same keys that you use to fight ordinary powers. They are not the same key that you use to cast out demons. Why? You can say to a demon, in Jesus' name I cast you out. Principalities have legal grounds over some lives of some people. Why? Because they are invited into that life legally. As a Christian, how do you fight? What is the spiritual key that when you have it, you can fight against principalities and powers? I'll give you one, the blood of Jesus. And my time is, you know, is, is, is ended. And like I said, time will fail me to work these principles. 
because each of these principles, you know, can actually take a month to explore. But I am trusting the spirit of the Lord that you have something tonight. And, and as you seek progress, as you seek the manifestation of the Lord, as you seek miracles, as you seek the Lord, you know, to grant you breakthrough, I want you to remember that he wants you to be persistent. And as you're persistent, how should you be persistent? The law of identity, identify God, the law of worship, the law of alignment, the law of dependency, the law of consistency, the law of retribution, and finally, the law of acknowledgement. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I, I be obedient on today. <laughs> Heavenly vision of making sure that the time is not, you know, exceeded. This is exactly eight o'clock, and that's when I'm supposed to end. Thank you very much for uh, this time. My prayer is that this week, as you, as, you, as you go through all the things that we've talked about within this period up till now, that the Lord will open your eyes of understanding. That Amen. as you stand between and before any doors, that God will give you the key, the scripture to fire, to get your miracles. Praise Amen. the Lord. Hallelujah. Does anybody have a question that we can't take? Oh, I see something. I see a chat. Uh, let me see whether there's a question there. Okay, so I have uh, answered those questions. Okay, is there anybody that has a question that must be answered before we call it a close? All right, otherwise we will actually, uh, my principal is already looking at me, Sister so let me not exceed that time. Let's uh, pray. Please uh, give your offering. And uh, let me actually, Mommy Pastor does this more, better than myself. Let me um, pray. Let's just share a word of prayer before I hand over to her. Father, the entrance of your word giveth light. The Bible says that you have taken us away from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. The kingdom where there is marvelous light. Father, we pray tonight by the reason of the word that has been shared. These principles, oh God, according to your word. Heavenly Father, we pray that illumination will come into our lives. Father, mm -hmm. may we, oh God Almighty, never remain the same again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, as we apply your word, encourage our hearts with testimonies. Let Amen. us see your divine working and your blessings upon our lives to the Amen. glory of your name and to the shame of the devil. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Pastor. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and give our offering. And as we go, the Lord, as we give the Lord bless us in Jesus' name, Amen. shall we please pray? Father, what shall we render unto you, o Lord? Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness in our lives. Thank you, Father, for this seventh month, for how far you have helped us. Thank you for your faithfulness concerning each and every family in Chapel of Grace. Daddy, we say be thou exalted in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word that you have sent to us tonight. We pray that these words will mix with faith, even as we apply it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Daddy, we pray that your word will dwell in us richly in Jesus' name. Amen. And for your daughter that you have used tonight, we pray that you will fill her afresh in, my, in the name of Jesus. Amen. New option, new grace, new anointing in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And every one of us, we cover us with the blood of Jesus. Oh, and Jesus we pray Christ. that your name alone will continually be glorified in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. As we give our offering, we pray that you will accept us. You will accept the offering. You, you, you will use it for the glorification of your work in Jesus' name. Jesus and your name. name alone shall be glorified. Thank you, Thank you our Father and our God. Be Thank thou you. glorified, O Lord. For in Amen. Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Shall we go ahead and share the grace in fellowship? The, the grace, grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of God, and the and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Surely, His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. For we shall live, we, we shall, shall not die. die. We, we shall, shall live to declare the works of the Lord, 
in the land of the living, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.